and welcome to Recipe for Success. My name is Nancy Giacalone, and I have a very special guest with me today, Joe Tooney, who's going to talk about his recent book, Unimaginable Loss. Um, but for those of you joining us for the very first time, Recipe for Success came about from my love of cooking. I was in the kitchen one day and just kind of thinking about how it's so critical that there's always one ingredient or technique that is really makes or breaks the recipe. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized the same thing is true in life and business. And so that's where I came up with the name for this um, podcast. So today we're going to go a little bit off script from what we normally do. And Joe is somebody I have known for a good portion of my life. We went to high school together. And I don't think we've seen each other in at least 40 years. It's minimum 40 years. So quite the little reunion we have going on here. Unfortunately, the reunion is due to um, a really tragic set of circumstances that has occurred in his life. Over a two and a half year period of time, he, um, his daughter, his only child, was murdered by her um, ex-partner's father, so her child's paternal grandfather. Um, shortly thereafter, his wife died from lung cancer. And then um, he was in quite a battle to retain custody of his only grandchild, Angel, and eventually lost her as well to her father, who played an instrumental role in some of the things that occurred with his granddaughter. So as a result of it, he has written this book. Um, hopefully you can see that, Unimaginable Loss. We will um, provide a link to this at the end of the podcast. And it was just released a couple weeks ago. Um, I did have the good fortune of reading it in advance, but um, I'd like to welcome Joe to the podcast, allow you to introduce yourself, and tell everybody a little bit about you. Well, first of all, Nancy, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I'm Joseph Tooney, and it is good reading. Good to see you after all these years. And yeah, we're just kind of at a position now to where, um, with the book, is, you know, it's one of those things that I never thought that I would be writing a book and discussing all of this, but the background is a great woman for 33 years, a businessman, a father, grandfather, and, uh, you know, as you and I have discussed is, you know, things move along in life and then all of a sudden it can change in the blink of an eye. And that's what took place with us five years ago, in the blink of an eye things changed. And now I'm in the position of really advocating uh, for something that is obviously near and dear to me. It is advocating for women and children and grandparents. I mean, it's multifaceted. Uh, you know, what we face and what we're going to have to try to change here for our future of our children and families is it's numerous things that need to change. I'm here for the one issue of children and women at this point in time and, uh, and trying to right or wrong and, and to truly find justice for my girls. Yeah, um, I, I could say I read the book and it was, and I talked about this, it was it was hard for me to read the book, um, not because it was, not because it wasn't well written, but because I could relate to it so deeply and not because I had gone through any of these situations, but very similar to, a very similar story to your, your life story. I've been married to the same person for a very long time. I have one child, I have, a, you know, my first grandchild on the way. And all I could imagine as I was reading it being in that position, in your shoes, and having to go through that, it was just, it was, it was devastating to me to read. Um, I'm going to do the best I can to stay on um, top of all these comments because I have a feeling we're going to have a number of them. Um, I knew my mother would be joining for sure. She says, "Good morning to you. Ordered your book. Getting it tomorrow. God bless you." Uh, Nicholas Tarazi says, "I wish I could listen to the whole thing." Don't worry, Nicholas. Um, it will be recorded, and you can listen to it after the fact. Um, Okay, so let's go through a little bit of the history um, before we get into the actual book, because I think it will help people to understand the background. Um, you started off, I mean, your wife was battling lung cancer before everything kind of went sideways. Correct. So t tell us a little bit about what what that was like, because I think that's an important part of the story. It, it is, it is. Um, my wife was an executive with Safeway Inc. You know, she ended up uh, in 2015 having back pain and unexplainable back pain. And after a period of time of us going to neurosurgeons and trying to get answers and asking, could it be cancer? Is after about seven months of this, uh, 
you know, she was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And now Carla was one of those that wasn't a party that didn't smell people were born with things, but we found out in education you know, bone cancer doesn't care who you are, cancer doesn't care who you are. And so 15, that kind of started uh, what we will say is the chaos, you know, of the last seven years. And uh, watching your loved one go through that type of a thing is kind of the first part of the battle. So since that point is, uh, it has been, that we've been at war with something and battling something. And it's just one of those things you find yourself, uh, you pull from within and you do what's best. And we were fortunate for her that, you know, I had her for an additional five years. Uh, we had the best care up at Seattle Cancer Care. Um, it's an amazing facility. Oh, fantastic facility. And, you know, she does an issue with, it's not just lung cancer, she had to have a heart valve repaired, she had to have her back reconstructed. And if it wasn't for the University of Washington Medical Center, in Seattle Cancer Care, they just made it as seamless as possible in a very difficult situation. So, very grateful uh, for the care that she got. And it, yeah, I know that it bought her that extra time, you know, for us to yeah. share and be together as a family. Yeah. Um, I have a couple, couple more comments and questions. Um, so, again, I feel like this is going to be a little bit of a high school reunion. Michelle Harvey Agnes says, Good morning to you both. Sending a hug to Joe. Somebody who listens to a person um, says, How did he build? How is he so good? Not really sure how that pertains to this particular conversation, but well, we may come back to that. So thank you, awesome person. Um, I want to go back to you're battling this with your wife, and it, it it's all consuming. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're focusing all you're both focusing all your energy on getting her well. Yeah. You were blessed with an old with a daughter, your only child. Um, and during this time that you're going through this, there were things going on in her life as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, well, yeah, I mean, she um, she obviously had, had met this man, and uh, they didn't get married, but she ended up getting pregnant and had an angel. And so during that time, it is, you know, she as a single mother was doing her stuff, you know, building her career. Um, she ended up working for me in our, you know, all of our marketing. And, uh, it is just one of those things, and, and you hear about it, is it was just a relationship that was not a good relationship from the beginning. Um, always seemed to be a loggerheads over whatever issue. And uh, and she was just doing her best as a single mom to raise her little girl. And at the same time, is um, it was really beautiful because we saw when the diagnosis happened, is her relationship with her mom got closer than it ever was. And I think that's an amazing thing that happens when those kind of things happen in your life is everybody kind of pulls together. And we found that in our family, even though we were close, is we really became close during that time. And so we got, you know, try to help her through her situation, try to help her through tough times of, you know, not being supported uh, by this gentleman, uh, not really being a part of any of life. And so, you know, she was just fighting the battles of, of just being a woman, trying to establish herself, find herself and her own identity. And it was really beautiful because truly in the last, you know, four or five years of her life as she was finding herself and, uh, you know, starting her side gigs of doing websites for everybody. Uh, she had a great eye for uh, decorating and that type of stuff and was really getting into that. And, and it's just one of those things as you watch the frustrations of your child, you know, finding herself, having these personal battles, being a full-time mom is, um, you feel for them. Yeah. You, know, you can't help but feel for them. So, you know, we were just kind of watching that and it just kind of as things moved along there as she was coming into her own, it was beautiful. Um, she ended up finding a really good man and uh, they were engaged to get married. And so, you know, while we were fighting the cancer thing and she was doing hers, it seemed that things were like were coming, coming around for her, which we were really proud of. And then during this time, obviously, you spent a lot of time with Angel um, because she was single mom, and you you know you loved her, you loved your granddaughter, so um, you were fortunate to be able to have this wonderful relationship with both of them and spend a lot of time with her. And then something happened. Yeah, it did. Um, we have been seeing visitation, and this happened you know, over probably about a four month period. Angel would come back from visitations. 
and our house was a the mutual drop off, a great place because we lived between Kelso and Bowen, and we each party lived. And she would come back, and you know, prior to Brittany showing up, we would you know give her a bath, get her ready, and all that. But we noticed that you know she started you know, crying and really freaking out in the bathtub and talking about hurting down below. And uh, on the end of one event that really shook us is she came back from a visitation, went through that whole ordeal, gave her a bath, and uh, we could tell she was withdrawn in a way which was not like her. Um, there had been events with her wetting her pants all the time at school, uh, with us, which was not the norm, didn't want to be in the bathroom by herself. And uh, we were trying to figure out what's going on. And we knew the history of, you know, Kyle, his father, things that we were told went on. And so you're left to, your imagination can go wild. And so Carl and I were sitting in our family room and Angel announced what had taken place, the molestation. And of course, um, every emotion you can imagine, uh, you know, hurt, horror, everything. And so, you know, she told us what took place. We just loved up on her. And you could tell that she was relieved, you know, once, sure. once she was able to, to say that. And, uh, and then it became the thing where we had to, the following morning, we were planning a nice get together. It was Mother's Day. So we got to, uh, we went, we held off on telling our daughter that night because her and Tyler were out for a date. And we ended up having to tell her on Mother's Day what had happened with her daughter. And uh, as you can imagine, our daughter's world was just thrown upside down on her feet. On top of what was going on with her mom and everything else. And that kind of started that part of the story. So um, one thing that in the book gives a little bit of background is that you are already aware of the fact that Kyle, who is Angel's father, mm -hmm. had conveyed that there had been molestation in his past by his father, correct? Yeah, the exact, what he had told, not just, you know, Brittany and us is also mutual friends, is that he was inappropriately touched. Okay. We never got into really anything right. because it was like, okay, that's enough. But there, there was enough of an indicator that, Definitely. That, that something wasn't right. Definitely. So when Angel came to you and told you this, it didn't seem inconceivable. It was not inconceivable. In fact, prior to that, a month prior to her telling us, Carla and Brittany actually took Angel to their doctor, who then wanted them to go immediately to Legacy. And uh, what they obviously do to start the investigation with everyone else medically and all that. And my daughter just freaked out knowing this is going to create something that I don't know I'm ready to deal with. Sure. I, we don't know, we don't have proof. And of course, we didn't know at the time uh, because in the parenting plan and everything else from the very beginning when she was born, is that because of what we were told, not only by Kyle, but by his mother, is that we were aware that Scott, the grandfather, was just not a good guy. Sure. And so we didn't know that Angel's around the grandfather. Didn't know it at all. Come to find out it was more than we could have ever imagined. So we, wrongfully, were thinking, Kyle doing this? And it wasn't. But once again, is you know, as you're going through this, you're just, it's mind boggling, as you can imagine, Nancy, what goes through your head. And so for us, it was just like, okay, what's the deal, what happened? And once it came out, is it befuddled us, because when we tried to sit down with Kyle, um, he refused, just would not. And then, then to come find out that she actually went to him first, and he wouldn't believe. So, so uh, Angel went to Kyle, her dad, to tell her about the paternal grandpa mm -hmm. doing this, and dad says, no, that can't be true. Am I understanding that correctly? You are, yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, so now Brittany, your daughter, mm -hmm. has this information. She's tried to reach out to Kyle, and Kyle says no. Mm -hmm. What are her next steps? Well, I mean, she would obviously got the attorney um with and with angel obviously it all began as the next thing you know we had lewis county involved because uh, that's where the grandfather lived uh, started an investigation 
um, got a hold of child services, DCYS, and went in for the interview that had the detectives, had everything, and this little seven-year-old girl marched into a room with mirrors and everybody around all by herself and uh, was interviewed uh, extensively. I mean, they were in there a good 45 minutes. And when they came out, um, DCYS representative and Detective Fraze, who was with you know, the city and county up there, they both said, we, we firmly believe her. She's consistent. She was strong and then just that, yes, we believe it. And then that's when charges were drawn up and that process started. So eventually there was a restraining order yes. against um, paternal grandfather, correct? Correct. And that restraining order said he could not be near her. Is that correct? It originally started out that in the parenting plan, it was he was not to be um, unsupervised. Okay. Then it was he was not to be around her at that point in time. And unfortunately, it's not not even that he was that she was taken around him. Um, Kyle actually had lived with him two different times. Once when he lived up north, and then uh, the grandmother's house, which is signed over to Scott, uh, three months prior to Brittany's death, is. They were living together in that house. So, so Kyle, the dad, knows all this information. He's there's been a parenting order. There's been a restraining order. You've talked to him. His daughters talked to him, and he's just in his mind has decided this is not true. Correct. Okay. So, Brittany um, doesn't have a choice. She has to comply with the parenting order. Correct. That's correct. So even though it's got to be horrifying to her to drop her child off with dad, yes. I don't know what was the frequency once a week. It was every other week. So every other week she's got to drop she's got to drop Angel off. She's got to feel sick to her stomach. Mm -hmm. She's completely out of control, and this goes on. But then something changed again as far as like the routine of the drop offs. So you used to do it all at your house. So how did how did what changed? There was all of a sudden Kyle wanted something different. Well, and this would have been right prior to the murder. Is it was always consistent, and then it was um, the visitation prior uh, for its murder. It is again they changed the drop off, and it was a request for her to uh, bring Angel up to Kelso. Yeah, which we're like, we don't understand because typically on those visitations, his other daughter that he had, uh, they lived in Woodland, and his wife was uh, estranged. And so he would pick that daughter up to be with Ava because Ava was felt more comfortable with the half sister there. Sure. So, um, so yeah, they changed that. And then uh, the day that it happened is we were on our way back from Seattle Cancer Care. And, you know, she's texting us, going, I don't know what's going on. It's changing the drop off again. And not really liking doing this. And we're saying, well, tell them none. You know, and she kept sending us the text of, you know, what he's saying, you know, hey, I did this, or he picked up the other daughter. Could you please? And finally, just in this, that's Brittany Fine. It's just like, this isn't worth it. He just wore her down. Yeah, it's just like, ah, oh, fine, I'll, I'll drop her off. And uh, you know, and we you know we knew it was strange because it's because of you know the relationship not being good for years, and it did work out best as that mutual deal. You know, but if he was changing us all of a sudden, we were just kind of wondering why. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, we found out why uh, on a day that uh, yeah, pretty unbelievable. Okay, so this is the hard. This is the hard part. But tell us about that day. And I, I know I'm sorry to have to ask it, but I, I, no, it's it's the only okay. way we can really tell the whole story. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, we were obviously on our way back, and uh, Carla's cancer had progressed where it went into a nervous system. And we had another dear friend, and we experienced the same thing. It didn't last long. So we kind of knew we were, you know, time was against us, but we kind of got a semi good report. We were looking forward to telling Brett. Sharing that with, and timing worked out wise. You know, we were kind of looking at time and the drop off, and we said, "Hey, looks like we're going to you know, be in Kelso a few minutes early." 
when you say we hook up in the house and tater tots and pop and talk a little bit before you have to drop her off. So we met in Kelso and, uh, you know, sat there and they got in the car with us and we were just talking. We didn't talk about the cancer issue because it was, you know, yeah. loving up on each other prior to Angel having her visit. And then it came time that she had to, you know, drive up the hill and, and drop Angel off. And, uh, so we said, gave her hugs, told Angel, yeah, told Angel we'd see her in, uh, you know, two days. And, you know, Brett said, love you guys, we'll see you in 20 minutes to a half hour. So we got on on-ramp, started south, and we did, we were probably about a few miles out of Kalama, and my phone rings, and it was Angel's phone. And uh, we know that Brett kept her phone on the visitation, we're like, why is, why is she calling on this? Well, I was on speakerphone. I answered. Hello. And it was Brett. And she um, frantically, not even, not even a good explanation. Uh, she goes, Daddy, Daddy, I've been shot. I've been shot. Scott shot me. Get here quick. Um, I'm dying. And of course, Anybody, a special parent, I mean, blood just rushes between one exploding your head and rushing out of your body and everything else. You know, Carla, she, you know, gasps and, you know, I get off the exit, we're telling her, I'm telling her, I'm coming, we're going to be there. And she kept, you know, saying, Daddy, you got to get here. I'm bleeding bad. And, and what we didn't understand is that after she had dropped Angel off, is that she pulled down and the grandfather was waiting in a rental car at the end of the street to ambush her. And uh, what she had, he had stopped and in fact witnesses said they saw the car, saw the guy with the mask, everything else. And he got out and shot her twice. Uh, she hit the gas, slammed in the rental car, and tried to get away. So she drove down the hill to the Arco station, pulled up to the Arco station, was trying to get help. Uh, actually, not the marshal was there, but didn't have a pistol there at all. And next thing you know, down the hill comes the grandfather, pulls up beside her. She tries to pull out, of course, she's in shock. She's bleeding bad. And she hits the gas, runs into a concrete median out in front of the gas station. Airbags go off trapped her in the car. The whole time we're hearing. Sure, because she's on speakerphone. She's on speakerphone. Oh my God. And she's like, Daddy, Daddy, get here. And her last words were, get Ava, get Angel. And uh, and then we heard three pops. And uh, then my silence. And of course, we were probably about a few miles from the exit. Um, Carla screaming, trying to get her to respond, and um, there wasn't a response. And as we're moving along, we can hear like banging on the window, and we're thinking he's trying to get to her again. And as we come off the exit, there's lights from cop cars coming from everywhere. We pull up behind the cop cars, and I. Uh, I just asked, I said, stay here, Carla, and uh, I'm going to go check. And I got within about 60 feet of the car, and I could see her slumped over, but it was, it was actually the policeman trying to bust the window to get into it, so yeah, it's what yeah. we were hearing. And as I was walking, I looked over, and I saw a dead body underneath the sign, and presumed that Scott they didn't know. And it was trying to please stop me, wanted to know who I was, told him. And I said, my, my granddaughter was with my daughter. Can you please check? And they did. And then I saw the policeman reach in and tug on Britain and just, she just slumped over the console. And, uh, you know, I'm just like, okay, she's gone. Yeah, she's gone. And, uh, and they, I said, I, I want to go see him. They wouldn't let me go see her. And they said, you know, now under a police investigation, we can't let you do that. So I walked back to the car. 
Carlos pretty much knew what was going on. That it was okay, so I go with Don. And, uh, you know, the chaplain was there right away. Um, and they started asking questions. They came back and said that they had checked on it. You know, if Angel was in the car, I told them that she was wearing a watch, that it showed her up the hill, and they please get up there. And they had dispatched the police up there, and she was there, which was a relief. So she was with Scott and um, this, and her stepsister? Uh, with Kyle. I'm sorry, Kyle. Yeah, yeah. Kyle's the dad. Yes, I yeah, apologize. Yeah, yeah. No, no, so no so she, she was with Kyle. Mm -hmm. And what happened when the police went back? Well, from what we have in the police sure. reports, because obviously we weren't there, but... I, uh, when they went up and basically started asking the question, and was he aware or whatever, when it came to um, something happening to Brittany, it was just stone faced, monotone, uh, just like there was no emotion whatsoever. Uh, but then when they said that Scott was dead, I guess the emotions changed. And, um, yeah. Okay. So, probably one of the worst days of your life. Yes. Angel is with Dad, who at this point, you've got to be thinking is complicit in some way because Grandpa wasn't supposed to be anywhere close to your grandchild. Um, were you able to get her out of there? I called, um, I ended up calling his estranged wife and his mother to tell them what had happened and that they needed to get up there and get the girls. Yeah, get the girls. Of which a little bit later, I was told that they were on their way. Um, Kyle's mom ended up showing up when we were out there at the site along with her parents. And, uh, saying that uh, Kyle's ex-wife, or soon the ex-wife, was on their way to get them. And then it was probably an hour and a half later or so, I called her just to check, and I said, you have the girls. She says, I have them. I'm going back to my grandmother's in Woodland. Uh, and just so you know, Kyle is with us. And of course, yeah. Carl and I are just like, what? And then uh, and then she... She says, I don't, I don't care to be in the middle of this, but he wants me to tell you that you don't need to worry that you will get visitation. And of course, my response was, excuse me, my, my daughter is not even dead two hours, and you're telling me you're going to provide visitation. What the heck is going on? And... Uh, I mean, Carl and I looked at each other and we just went, oh yeah, we know what's going down here. And uh, so we had to wait, you know, it was about another hour, coroner shows up. Nothing more for us to do. We spoke with the police, we provided every bit of information we could. Uh, we knew Angel was safe. And, um, and then uh, Kyle's mom, of course, is like, oh, she needs to be with you guys, you're with them, your home is the comfortable place for her. And, and uh, so, you know, obviously a very, very sleepless night. And the next morning, had the conversation with his mom that we were going to meet down in Woodland at the, uh, the wife's grandmother's place to make up uh, Angel. And so we show up walk in the door and he's sit, kind of sitting on the couch and he won't look at me. Um, and he just mumbles, sorry for your loss. Don't worry. I'll make sure you get visitation. Uh, of course, my response was, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. There's a whole lot that's going to have to be discussed before we start talking about visitation and who has what. And so that's when Angel came walking out, big hugs, went out, she gave the other grandmother a hug and we got in the car and, you know. 
So from that point forward, she was living with you for a while. Yes. Um, okay. So how how did she process all that? Because I can't imagine that that's an easy concept for a seven year old, and she was seven at the time, correct? Yeah. To to process. Well, I think it made it a little bit more confusing to talk with her because it wasn't just to where she was with us. It was over the weekend. Events took place that were very perplexing to Carla and I. It is it came to where it was like, you know, yes, Angel needs to be with you. Yes, your comfort, all that. To the next day, having a conversation with Kyle's mom about, oh, the press is going to show up. We're really concerned about Angel. Or did it, you know, and we're like, there is no press. We control that. And what's the real issue? And then, well, she needs, she needs to be with her dad. Well, this is after we're told that he's catatonic, needs medication, needs help, and yet all of a sudden everything has changed. And, I'm, I'm, and I said, this is not going to happen. And then we were accused of kidnapping our granddaughter. Oh my God. Um, and on Sunday, you know, because we're just kind of watching things evolve, uh, we get a call because the angel went up to Tyler, who was my daughter's fiance, went up to his family's place because Carl and I needed to be dealing with some stuff. We get a call from the sheriff uh, telling us that if we don't surrender angel to Kyle, that there's a good chance that we would never see her again. And so I said, well, I said, we will surrender. Not to Kyle, but we will surrender to his mother. And so we did that evening, took her, and we immediately got a hold of our attorneys. And the next day, we were, we were filing for guardianship. And, uh, you know, and, and the whole time here, you know, obviously, Amy is confused. I can't even imagine. And, and hurt. And you know, you know, and, and she just the whole time she goes, I want to be with you and grandma. Like mean, we understand I mean we can't, you know, we don't have control at this point. Just know that we're gonna fight for you. And uh, the next day we end up had it immediately set up Brett had a counselor for Angel for the molestation mm -hmm. where it happened. And so we went there. Uh, Child Protective Services showed up to do an interview. Uh, the other grandmother was there because obviously we, she had to bring her because we had to drop her off and go through all of that. And in that afternoon, we had heard that the courts had granted us guardianship. It, it found Kyle unfit for numerous reasons. And so, you know, we gained guardianship and things seemed to be okay. Okay, so, so now you have an, an enormously confused little seven-year-old that's lost her mother, is confused about everything that's gone on. She's been tossed around like a beach volleyball for, you know, a couple of days during the most traumatic thing of her life. And so you and Carla are working to stabilize her and give her the love and support and counseling and everything that you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, not long after that, I think it was, I think I read it was about four months after that, that Carla finally passed away. She did. Um, I can't imagine how traumatic that was for you, but I would imagine it also had to be pretty traumatic for, for Angel, just one hit after another. It was. Yeah, I can't, uh, I can't even imagine for a little girl, any child that age, and had to be just with what had been happened to her prior, what happened to her mama, and the amazing, the other stable, right. you know, amazing woman in her life. And so, yeah, it was an interesting time. But but you you kept guardianship and custody of, mm -hmm. of Angel during this time, correct? I did. So, once again, something changed. It did. Um, it came time for the renewal of the guardianship. And unbeknownst to us, is there was a new statute law that had been put into play that uh, went from a non-parent custodian situation. It basically 
got rid of all of that, and it was a new law that had to deal with guardianship. And it's a it's a statute that I thought was written locally, which I probably couldn't handle easier, but it's by a national group that put this together. It's trying to get it out nationally. Uh, and the new law allows any biological parent, unfit, kind of saying, I'm unable, they can get custody of that child. And obviously we had to go back to court, go through the trial. Uh, we had all the information prior to when it's been shipped before, plus everything since. And under this new law, it's they won't take in the history. It's like you start from this point moving forward, which is unbelievable. So they didn't consider any of Kyle's history of poor parenting decisions. The judge, the judge said he did. The only problem is, is between testimony, because his soon be ex-wife testified on our behalf and discussed the domestic violence, the uh, other things that went on. Uh, her counselor, Angel's counselor testified of where this little girl wanted to be, where she com felt comfortable, how she was afraid and didn't feel comfortable around her dad, and everything else from investigation, CPS reports, and uh, we, we were talking <coughs> in, in court, it, in, in world, world down to, we went through all of this, reliving everything again, to be told twice in the court, if I had to, if I had to rule, based upon a quality of life for Angel. And he looks at me and says, Mr. Tooney, but I have to rule according to the law. And the problem is, is this law, and it's RCW 11130, it's now in place, the qualifiers are poor. It's just willing and able, got a job, and there's no proving anything. There's no proof that you have a job other than Oh, I worked here for six months, which we know what true. Do you have insurance? Yes. You don't have to prove insurance. You just have to say you do. And it's mind boggling that you erase any bit of history, you get beyond the beyond benefit of the doubt to someone that you look at all this and just go, everything that happened in this little girl's life was based upon it. His choices and decisions and ignoring laws, ignoring rules, and not caring about anybody but himself. And in particular, not putting Angel first. That's the number one. That's I mean that's, that's, I mean, that's the thing that jumps out. So so let's talk about this this law for a second. Um, I know that in prior to this, that grandparents were considered in um, guardianship custodial arrangements. And when I read it, and, and, I, and again, I'm, you'll have to correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but grandparents are essentially now put in the bucket with any other non-parent. Yes, basically a grandparent is considered no different than a third-party person standing on the corner. Yeah, that's what was yes. my understanding. Yes. So what was the intention of that? <sighs> that's a question that I'm trying to find out. Um, we're obviously working with lawmakers now, but it's just it's a slow process. Trying to get these answers is I don't think that anybody really has, nobody's been able to provide an answer, and I don't think anybody has a good answer on why this has happened. Um, you know, if we want to take a look at statistics of how many grandparents are actually caring for grandchildren, yeah, it, it's staggering. It is. Um, you know, and to take the family unit and just say, it's parental rights only, you help me, and it's just like, well, that's not real world. That's not real world. Uh, because unfortunately, our children and grandchildren, they have their issues. doesn't make them fit parents. Right. And if that is the case, you know, the number one issue in our laws is supposed to be for the benefit of the child. And that is being overlooked. It's not to the benefit of the child. They're making it to the benefit of a biological parent, which is beyond belief. I believe in parents' rights. In this case, they say, well, in this, you know, Joe, you don't believe in father's rights. Well, absolutely, I'm a father. I believe good fathers absolutely should have access and be with their children. But I believe that there's a history of showing that you are less than that worthy 
um, you shouldn't have that access. It's just we're, all we're doing is we're now creating the, the next generation of dysfunction, of non-nurturing, and you know, what are we doing here? And that's the problem with this law. Is, and it's only even when we were in the court and when it came down to the ruling, there were things that were laid out from the judge that needed to happen. And came September 1st, and it was, you know, tough summer. Tough summer going to, to choose a transition. But the problem it was is not one thing was followed. Not the counseling that he was, you know, he was supposed to get from both of them, not the counseling for her that was so important for her for a few years. Um, you know, support that I was supposed to be getting paid. Uh, I mean, nothing. And yet, when I brought this up in September, I was told by my attorney, is, it doesn't matter. And I'm like, what do you mean it doesn't matter? This is a ruling from a court. This is based upon somebody that is taking custody of the child and being credible and following through and doing the things that they're supposed to do. None of it happened yet. Transition just happened. So, so she's living with her father now. That is correct. And you do get visitation, as he foreshadowed um, on that terrible day. How often do you get to yeah, spend time with Angel? I have uh, one weekend a month, and then I split part of the uh, Christmas holidays, and I get her uh, three weeks of the summer. How's she doing now? Um, we'll find out I have her this weekend, uh, which we're looking forward to. Um, we we're not we're not sure because unfortunately um, she has not communicated other than the visitation that I had a month ago. Uh, this week and a half prior to that, an event took place. Um, a conversation was overheard by my sister on speakerphone with Angel. Is that uh, she's had no communication with any of us on my side of the family. All of her friends, cousins, and all that stuff that she would communicate with, play games, and, and whatever, uh, they've had no response at all from her now for almost a month and a half. So, this little girl has lost her mother. Mm -hmm. She lost her grandmother. Mm -hmm. She's been tossed around, um, I could say, like a beach volleyball in, in home living situations, is now living with a father who didn't believe her. <clears throat> I just can't even imagine. I just can't even imagine the trauma that that has that she's experienced and how that's going to affect her later in life. It's uh, I mean it's it's overwhelming. Um, but let's go back to the legal system for a minute um, because I'm not going to call it a justice system, as you and I have have already spoken. It doesn't feel like justice is feels like justice is rarely rarely served. It's sometimes mm -hmm. just about the laws. So this um, law that was passed that has essentially eliminated grandparent rights or other family member rights. I also want to say before I say that is that you have an extremely close family. You are surrounded by people that support you, that love you, that love her. So it's not just you on an island. When she's with you, she is in an extended family. But so this this law has come up and now she's isolated essentially. Um, what are you doing to change it? What are you doing to address this? What can anybody else do to, to help in this fight? I'm sorry for that side, but no, um, I it's understandable. It's it's daunting because none of this there's no such thing as a quick fix. No, there never is. Um you know, I've been to Olympia and just kind of watch what goes on there and how you have fifteen minutes to meet your, you know, representatives <laughs> and try to get your point through and that other means of uh, the capital to get this done. And you know, the issue is is this is a law that was really pushed through by Jamie Peterson, who is the you know majority chair of the state senate, and you know it's one of those things is that I'm asking the representatives from my districts to please get me an audience because they answer, you know I'll, I'll give a quick answer to you and just say unfortunately there is nothing that can be done that is going to help this little girl quickly. No, I, I can see that. But but there's other there's other children out there. There's other situations. And I know that's part of the reason you wrote this book is because you want to make people aware of what can happen if, if we don't address these issues. 
decisions based upon this law, and not just this law. There's other things that are going on to where rapists are getting plea deals. Uh, you know, women who are trying to get protection orders renewed aren't getting renewed, and no different than the Melendez case in Clark County right now. Right. Women and children are dying, and children are going in the hands of people that they really should not be with. And until, as a collective, that we understand what's going on every day with these laws and what's going on, we are compounding an issue that is just going to continue to get worse. It's going to strain our system. We are creating something for our children in the future that unless something is done as quickly as possible, we're going to have to have a whole new portion of our health care system and mental health care system that is going to have to deal with these decisions that are being made now. We are perpetuating a situation to where children are being put in positions to not be happy, not be nurtured, and to be negative statistics. We have to do better. And so, while I would love to say this A, B, and C is what we can do to change this, because it's all new to me and I'm learning the process, is this is where we need to band together. As citizens of Washington have got to know what's going to go on here. If we think that our kumbaya world is just going to continue, Telling you the blink of an eye can change, and you will be where I'm sitting, and it's not it's not a fun place. I'm hoping that the, you know, in talking to different parties, I already know of other examples of children being taken away from nurturing grandparents, aunts, whoever, family members, and giving with drug addict parents, alcoholics, abusive, and they're being torn from these environments and handed over because of this new law. Yeah. And it has to be amended. It has to be addressed. Not only does there have to be the qualifiers, you know, to make a ruling, a sound, good ruling for the best interest of this child, is there has to be checks and balances. There has to be follow-ups. There has to be wellness checks. If you're going to do the right by these children, follow all the way through. Here it's just like ruling. So, so you're telling me that CPS is no longer involved, they don't do mental health checks on her on a regular basis? No, this is the other fallacy of our system. That and is insane. Well, I would not want to be a CPS worker. No. Because CPS, law enforcement, and the courts are not working in unison to the benefit of family, children, or whatever. There are these separate entities, reports, investigations are done, whether it is by CPS, whether it is by law enforcement, and based upon how a law is written, that can all just be pushed aside in disregard. That's what's happened. And that's got to change. Um, like I said, no people that work at CPS, and I couldn't do their job. Same thing with the police. They are doing all of this work. The Kelso police, Nancy, they did a phenomenal job. They multi Washington State police, Vancouver police. I mean, they put all of this stuff together. And, you know, of all things, misdemeanors that Kyle was charged with, they got a plea deal. And, and it's just one of those things you're just like, on all levels, we have a system that seems to be melting down and nobody wants to address it. You know, one of the things that um, comes to my mind with regard to the legal system in general is that um, there's these bills that are floated out there, mm -hmm. and they tell you the glossy part of it. They say, oh, this is going to be so good, but they don't tell you all the other parts of it. And these things are passed, and then they result in unintended consequences that, that no one knew they were supporting because... That was all buried. It was just, you just got the highlight. You got the Cliff Notes version. Hey, this is going to be so good for everybody. And all of a sudden, it's not good. You have just sit on a huge point. Um, in talking with lawmakers, a couple of them have, you know, said, I did not vote for this because of this reason. And then a couple say, well, I did, but did not realize. Because what's ended up happening is the national group that wrote this law and they're trying to slam it to every state they can. And we have two states and 17, Washington being one of them, is it should be just a child situation where you're dealing with child law. What they've done is combine this with adult guardianship and conservatorship and try to make this a one size 
happy meal on legislation. That, oh, this takes care of everything. This makes it easier to do, and it's not. Um, two separate issues. To put it all together, convolutes it, and you're right. Everything gets lost in the minutia. What's all back here? And this is the benefit of, and all of that stuff. And they say, oh, the National Bar Association supported it. Well, that may be, but the Washington Bar Association didn't. They've still got slammed through. And that's, you know, that's just where I'm hoping. I you know, and once again, I don't care party affiliation. It's not a political issue. It's not. This is where, you know, I need both sides to listen. I need both sides to understand what's going on. And every day, we're sitting here right now, there's a ruling being made in the court in this state that's putting another child in jeopardy. So remind me of the RCW number. It's 11130. Okay. So anybody that is in Washington State that happens to be listening right now, RCW 11130, um, write to your local politicians, your representatives, your senators, your state representatives, and ask them to review it and understand it and refer them back to this podcast, if you must, to have a better understanding of exactly how it is affecting children. This is one example, just one example. Um, but, it, you know, Joe was brave enough to come on here and tell the story again, to put this in the book. He's lived through this so many times, and I'm sure it does not get easier with each telling. I can't imagine that it's ever easy. Um, but this is something that you can do something about. Every single person can do one thing, reach out and, and let people know this is wrong and it's affecting children. And that's the main point, is it's affecting children. They're not safe with this law. Sure. Um, just, we could, we could go on for hours, um, but I do have to more or less wrap this up. I want to remind everybody this book, um, Unimaginable Loss, is available on Amazon. Um, it, I believe they can get it through, a, through the Kindle version as well, correct? Okay. Okay, so go on Amazon, read this book. The legal details are in there. There are excerpts from the police reports. There's excerpts from the, the, find, the court findings. This is not a fairy tale. This is real life. Uh, I shouldn't say a fairy tale, a nightmare. This is a real life story, and all the facts back it up. And despite all the facts and all the situations that occurred here that, that lead any logical person to understand that the best decision would have been for Angel to remain with Joe and his family, she is in a not a positive environment. And she's going to have lifelong repercussions from this. And you need to read this, you need to understand it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I have an only child, I have my first grandchild on the way, and as we have been talking through this, it just puts a pit in my stomach that this it can even happen. I just want to thank you so much for sharing your story and letting people hear it and and know how they can take action. Uh, not only to support you and Ava and Angel, but to support their children and their grandchildren. Um, I think it's, it's a really important message. Well, I, mean, I thank you for this opportunity. I do know as we move along here is, you know, and uh, yeah, just to me.com. We're going to have it to where we want other people that are going through this process and have decisions made. We want to hear from them. We want to build an audience of, of folks to where we can all bang together for a common effort. And the more that we talk, the more that we learn, the more that we can help each other, the more we can heal. Um, you know, like I said, this is this is not a slam dunk in any way, but this is where. There's not one person that I've not talked to. There's not one person that has read this book. That's kind of like, you know, people feel this might be said. Mm -hmm. It is hard. I can, you know, my life, my story, that's yeah, unbelievable. It is hard to read because it's real. Mm -hmm. It's just real and it's raw. And the only thing that matters is the children. It is. That's it. So thank you very much, Nancy. Appreciate it. Yes, um, I will post links on this as well, um, so you can uh, link to the book. Um, as we get more information, as Joe sets up his website, I will be sharing that information as well for people to find those resources and to be able to share their stories. Um, thank you all for tuning in today. Um, this was a this was a tough one. Um, it was a tough one for me too, I have to say. Um, but thank you all for joining us today, and um, we'll see you next week. All right.